Today, we're going to be playing a solo run with Haxorus in Pokemon Red. Not only that, I will be using a shiny Pokemon for the first time in Gen 1. They really don't exist otherwise, I just made it. I'm not a huge fan of plugging shinies. I'm not into that cringy, like putting in the title, going for the clickbait and the thumbnail, but Haxu Community Day in Pokemon Go is tomorrow, June 10th, and I really couldn't pass up this opportunity. It sounded like a pretty neat run. This ROM was made using the Poke Red disassembly, and the decomps that I use as a base are in the description and if you want to play the patch try this out for yourself it is available to channel members and patreons if you are interested in that sort of thing the rules for the run as well as an unlisted video to dive a little bit deeper into that sort of stuff into my philosophy my setup for the runs it's also in the description if you want to take a gander at that and before we dive in proper likes and comments they go a long way to help channels grow and if you are a returning viewer like wade avery that actually suggested this video to me i do appreciate the support i really i just appreciate anybody who just takes a second out of their day to help me out with that sort of thing and with that out of the way i think you can just sit back relax the weekend's here grab yourself a soda pop and let's see how this one plays out I was initially, I was hesitant to do this run. It didn't really look that great or interested. It like it had a predictable late game. It's in the slow leveling group and we'll dive into the aspects that I really enjoyed about this run. But first, let's cover a core aspect that's gonna make Haxorus really solid and that's gonna be Dragon Rage. We've seen this in action in an older event move Magikarp video I did. And this is a move that can make even that little pathetic fish crush the early game. This does a flat 40 points of HP damage damage and the first seven mandatory battles of the game include Pokemon that don't even have 40 HP so it makes things really trivial and even after that there's lots of spots up to about Bill's house that make it still pretty useful. It does only have 10 power points. What I'm trying to say is that it's really strong and we really don't have to pay too much attention to the early game. We can just dive deeper into Haxorus. Despite what you might think at first, what some people might think, Haxorus is not a pseudo legendary. It's just a cool gen 5 dragon and as a result, the base stats, they're a little bit lower on average than something like Dragonite, but 480 is still pretty high. At first, this run kind of felt eerily similar to something like Iron Thorns that we did a little bit earlier in the year, in the fact that it's an absolute monster with that 147 base attack, but we really can't utilize it for a while, and instead we have to rely on our much weaker special stat. But Haxorus is faster than that run, and there's some other advantages as well. Now let's talk about this learn set. Haxorus, by far its best learn set is Gen 7, and honestly, several of the other generations, they really screw it over, especially on the starting learn set. And for me personally, I feel like there's no point in doing a cross-gen run if you're just not going to go all out, toss off the inhibitors, and let a Pokemon run wild. Who wants to see, who even wants to go through the trouble to make a ROM if something's just going to struggle? It just, it doesn't sound very fun to me. To help us out, we do start with Outrage. This move is kind of like a Thrash clone, where you'll spend one power point it's gonna go on for three or four turns and then you'll get confused but 120 base power it's massive guys and with stab it's gonna hit like a freight train keep in mind that dragon is a special type in gen 1 so we do have to use our lower special stat for this throughout the game outside of that we'll talk about the extra moves later as they come up and Haxorus doesn't really translate well for the TMs here he doesn't really get that many but you do get premier physical moves like swords dance earthquake rock slide and we don't really need to talk about about those right now in the video. I've already alluded to how trivial Dragon Rage makes the early game and Brock, he doesn't even get an intro this week. This one is just two Dragon Rage and that's it. We're moving on at lightning speed. Next up, I'm gonna talk about Outrage a little more because it's been a long time since I've talked about Thrash or anything similar. It's a really good finishing move in a battle and the fact that you can use a single power point and have it go on for three or four turns really lets you delay healing because of PP problems. Dragon Rage is really great early Early, but you can only do it 10 times and something like this move helps a ton especially when your only other option is scratch in this early game ideally you would play it out do the battle and you would use this move when the battle will be over in three turns or less but here on the very first bug catcher you can see things 
go a little bit wrong. I get unlucky and the first Caterpie doesn't get knocked out, but I do offset that bad luck by getting a pretty lucky four turn outrage here. I avoid confusion and you never, you don't want to hit yourself when you have 147 base attack. Let me tell you that. Most of you guys, you know that my runs are optimized and you're seeing the final product of several runs here, but I do always plan on a three turn outrage. And if a battle has four turns left, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to use something else and then we'll just try to avoid this drawback entirely. So you'll see a four turn outrage here. This is the last time you'll see it in the video. It was kind of like a happy little accident. Let's move on. I'm going to talk about Mount Moon here and I keep things to the minimum track as far as the run goes, but I want to talk about RNG and luck. In my runs, I do try to eliminate some things that are up to chance like making HM users more accessible and doing things like automatically solving the surge trash can puzzle. But wild encounters, there's something that I don't change. I don't like to change too much from the vanilla game, but I would like to say that I had to scrap two runs entirely because of some really crazy Mount Moon runs. I would say the medium rate for these runs is somewhere around 10 to 13 encounters or somewhere around that area. And I had two runs guys, two runs with over 20 encounters in here. I'm not too much of a stickler for getting perfect runs. I don't keep resetting. I only play three runs usually, but the run before this one, guys, I had 27 encounters and it added literal minutes to my time just in this segment alone, this little early segment. And it was the worst luck I've had out of any time I've ever played Pokemon Red in my entire life. And I really just wanted to document that in video format so I can go back and listen to it later and roll my eyes. 27 encounters. Come on. At the end of Mount Moon, the super nerd here is where you're going to encounter the first mandatory Pokemon that has over 40 HP. It's this coughing here and this is where Dragon Rage slowly starts to become irrelevant and start to fall off the cliff but that's not that important. At level 13 we get our next new move and it's called Dual Chop. It gets stabbed, it has 40 base power and it hits twice like double kick and it's a nice compliment so that we don't have to lock ourselves into outrage when Dragon Rage wouldn't work and I'm always wary about the lower accuracy of moves like this but 90% it's not really the worst thing in the world and I think we can just take this all the way to Cerulean Gym. And we'll talk about Dragon Typing a little bit more, but defensively, it's one of the top tops in Gen 1 next to something like maybe Ghost. It resists all basic elemental tops, including water. And for Misty here, it means that she'll use her much weaker moves because she has good AI. So we're just getting tackled today. Dragon Rage is not going to one shot many more things in the run, but it can easily two shot Pokemon Steel at this stage in the game. And it makes this one essentially a free win. I do get really low here here but I don't even bother to heal before the fight and that's because this one it was just really consistent in practice. The change to take on Misty first here really allowed me to cut out all the optional battles and just keep it to the minimum track and in a ton I would say most situations facing rival number two at minimum battles and subsequently do a nugget bridge without extra levels it can cost you a lot of time especially when you're in the slow leveling group. I think the fact that Haxorus has good speed combined with the early game killer like Dragon Rage and a stupidly strong nuke and outrage. It meant that the extra training just really didn't do much other than waste time. But let's kind of look into rival number two and we'll see how that plays out. Pretty much like every other Gen 1 run we've ever seen in your entire life, uh, you just don't want to see a sand attack. And since we outspeed and Dragon Rage can two shot, it has one chance to be annoying. And a quick attack here on the first turn seals this little bird's fate. You might notice from Misty and this Pidgeotto here that it looks like I'm just getting hit really hard and I'm really squishy, but I promise you it's just due to the fact that we're at minimum battles here. The slow leveling group, it's awful for solo runs and I'm very under leveled and I'm really starved for stats at this point in the game. But the rest of the battle with no sand attack debuff along with outrage to finish it off, it's just really strong and we do get through here. Now let's go back talking about dragon types real quick. This time let's talk about it offensively. In generation one, there's no actual damaging dragon moves that get stabbed and you really never get a chance to see it shine. So here I'm going to shine a light on it. We're going to take a, a deeper dive. Now, since this is a pocket of time before things like Fairy and Steel Tops were even a thing, Moves like Outrage, they just have free reign over Kanto. Nothing resists Dragon type, and it's almost, it's a better version of the already incredibly strong normal type, which you only have to worry about Ghost and Rock types there. I guess I'm bringing this up because messing around with this run and Outrage specifically, it really made me kind of curious about an actual special focused Dragon that maybe had access to something like Outrage early, and I wonder how it would do. If you guys have any suggestions, uh, maybe go look at some learn sets and point me in the 
right direction, but overall, this part of the game it's not bad despite not having extra levels. Outrage is so strong it can handle most things, and then Dragon Rage still has its uses littered here and there, and the newly acquired Dual Chop, it can just handle everything between those two. At the end of this route we do hit level 20, and that's huge, I can't stake this enough, it's huge for Haxorus. It gets us access to Slash, and since crits are based on speed in Gen 1, it means we're guaranteed we're critting all the time, boys. Combined with our base attack, this is going to be our bread and butter, our go-to move for a, a pretty long while. And if we take things all the way down to the SSN, it's worth noting that Haxorus actually doesn't learn Body Slam in any generation. But I do think Slash outperforms Body Slam until we make it to seal up a little bit later anyway. We'll come back to that. I'd also like to quickly say that in my decomps I use to make ROMs, I'm always tweaking, designing new takes on Pokemon Red. I want to give it a fresh coat of paint, keep it fresh, and you might have noticed that this one's a little bit different. I'm using Pokemon Yellow Colors, and the sprites for this ROM, they're from the 1997 Space World demo. That was an early build of Pokemon Gold and Silver, and the sprites here, they can range anywhere from pretty much top tier, from outright strange, and if I remember, I'll call out some as we get through the video. And as for the SSN, I just take on the gentleman, that's all I do, he's guarding the rare candy, I want that. Uh, Growlithe, if you noticed it, it was an interesting sprite, and I think we can just talk about rival number 3. And now the world is our cloister now that we have access to Slash. This Pokemon, it was already really solid without access to its attack stat, but now that we got that guaranteed crit, stuff is dropping like flies, there's not really much to say about this battle, and I guess we can go straight into Lieutenant Surge. Now I'm just, I'm whopping his weaker Pokemon off the map, I'm throwing them off the docks, I'm just taking the Voltorb like a basketball and just shooting it off the pier. And Raichu, it only has resisted electric moves to throw on me, and you can just see from this footage that our power level, it's, it's going up a whole lot. From there, I think we can skip over Rock Tunnel. We can pick it up in Celadon. Now I'm doing the standard route here, and I'm going to the Rocket Hideout. I'm gonna take on these trivial battles. I'm gonna pick up high money items, and I'm gonna go back to what I said about Body Slam not being as good as Slash. I'm gonna elaborate a little bit and give you guys some numbers for that. I bring this up here because Double Edge is found, and you guys know that I love Double Edge. I always like to test it out, and when you have attack this high, a 100 base power move is hard to pass up. You at least have to give it a look. You know what I'm saying? But let's go over how crit damage works. In generation one, the damage a crit does scales with your level. And at level 26, the modifier for that is roughly about 1.84 times damage on a crit. Effectively, this means that Slash is getting, uh, at this stage in the game, it's a 128 power move, really high. It's only getting stronger each level due to that scaling. Crits in gen one do ignore changes in stats. So let's say if you use the leer on the enemy or you pop the swords dance on yourself, it's just gonna ignore that it's going to go off your base stats it doesn't count the boost this is why we're not going to be using slash the entire game and i'm sure maybe a lot of you guys already know this kind of stuff but there's also a lot of people that simply never bother to look into the mechanics and it's always nice to kind of have a refresher or maybe just lay things out on the table especially when you consider how different gen 1 games can be compared to other pokemon games but overall we clean house here there's not really much to say about the rocket hideout i just wanted to talk about slash real quick next i go to erica and this one it was a little bit iffy I didn't know if I should do this or not and you're gonna see why two of her Pokemon have sleep inducing moves and even though we we resist grass and we have the really strong slash I can't quite one shot things now ultimately I wanted a little extra money and I kind of rolled the dice for this fight now outside of getting wrapped here and wasting some turns things are going pretty well for vile plume I go for the inferior outrage rather than slash I was hoping maybe I would crit and this was one of my worst fears here I get put to sleep there's not much to say it just it wastes a lot of time. I wasn't in any real danger of losing, but you guys know that the goal is to beat the game as fast as possible, and when you're getting put to sleep, it just it makes you waste a ton of time. I don't like it, but we still get through it. Now it's time for our one big mark buy for the run, and I keep it really simple today. All I want to do is go to the top floor, pop open a Sodi Pop, give it to the little girl, get Rock Slide, and I keep it even more simple for the vitamins. Since we are kind of under leveled, I do get five Carbos to keep up with some of the faster Pokemon and big fights, and we can just move on. Pokemon Tower is next, and you guys already know that rival number four is one of the easiest battles in the entire game. Things are incredibly easy here, and even Outrage at this point. After the battle, it can take out the Ghastlies, and the only real thing that I want to talk about here was the optimization of using a single rare candy at the end of Pokemon Tower. 
I'm really pushing Haxorus to the limits on this round and today, even just that single extra level, it went a long way in making this run feel really clean. To wrap up the final busy work of the game, I do head down to the Safari Zone, I get the final HMs of the run, I also pick up some vitamins here as well, and let's get down to what kind of made me worry about this run, let's just, we'll go on a little tangent here. It's time for Sylph, and I think you guys know where this one is heading. Remember, I'm going on a long vacation soon, I'm going to take a hiatus, so rather than leave you high and dry, I've been recording a backlog of videos, but this, this video was actually just recorded a few days ago. Whereas the videos you're going to see in coming up weeks, they've been recorded for quite a while. But the runs that have Earthquake, Swords Dance, Rock Slide, they, they, they feel so predictable to me. The pessimist in me, it always worries that if I do a video like this, I'm going to have a performance, I'm going to have a video bomb like Diggersby or Obstagoon. And you guys, I'm afraid you just won't like the content, I guess what it comes down to. I get that a lot of these cross-gen runs are a little bit trivial, but I do think that the fun and the intrigue, at least for me, is finding out which Pokemon's going to beat the game the fastest, which one's going to be the best, and we're looking at all these Pokemon from different generations and trying to find the best candidate. I think most of you understand that and you're interested as well. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that I want to make content that you guys enjoy. I don't want to release a bomb, lose subscribers, start to stagnate, you know, that kind of thing. But it's something I think about. Now, as far as the run goes, you already know it's time for that really hard pivot. We've already picked up the holy trinity of Rock Slide, Earthquake, and Swords Dance. And now, guys, I think we're going to see what Haxorus looks like when it's unleashed on rival number five. First up is Pidgeot and Sand Attack, it's still on the table. Since I'm three levels lower here, Rock Slide just can't do the job outside of a crit, so I do set up a Swords Dance and unfortunately I do take a Sand Attack here because Murphy's Law, it's in full effect here. I do take a Quick Attack, I miss the next Rock Slide, but the second one does connect and I'm moving on to the next Pokemon. Growlithe is next and I need an additional Swords Dance to avoid some annoying Execute status conditions and once again look at this Growlithe Sprite, it's really strange, I love it. On Execute, I actually hit the Rock Slide, but Arceus, once again, he's against me. I crit, which means it can survive, and things are just not going my way today. Then a Hypnosis connects on the next turn. My luck, it's just seemingly back and forth on this run, and it swings to the other side of the pendulum, and I wake up immediately. I hit the move, and I move on, and I was very happy with this result. But next up is Alakazam, and this is the first Pokemon that the Candy and the Carbos from earlier let me out speed, but Sand Attack has other plans. I missed the Earthquake. Confusion hits for a solid chunk of damage, Leech Seed is starting to tick, and to make things even more dicey, I miss the second Earthquake. Thankfully Alakazam just goes for Disable, and I have another shot, but Leech Life, it's still, I'm on the clock here. Next, I miss a third straight Earthquake, and this at this point I'm just like, alright, let's just start the run over, but Alakazam just goes for Recover, and as they say, the fourth time is the charm. I one-shot it, we have one Pokemon left, Blastoise is last, the two Swords Dance guarantee the one-shot here, and my missing streak is over, I fight through the sand attack, I quake the earth, and I get past this one. Obviously this wasn't a perfect result, but just like I said earlier about the encounter luck inside of Mount Moon, I just, I can't keep resetting run after run until I get perfect results, and overall the time loss wasn't anything too crazy here. It definitely wasn't a 27 encounter time loss on Mount Moon, but there is a slight deviation from the plan since I missed so many times with Earthquake. I do have to use an elixir after the pre-Giovanni rocket grunt, and I think overall this is what these kind of runs are all about, adapting and kind of mentally changing things on the fly, and I think that's probably one of the strongest traits you can have. I guess it goes for the game, maybe in life in general, when things don't go exactly how you drew them up, you gotta be able to do stuff on the fly. After we get done with Giovanni, the pace is going to quicken up a lot. Our move pool is stacked, we have enough speed to get past pretty much anything, and 147 base attack with Swords Dance in our back pocket, it's just the recipe to bend Kanto over and break its back. I'll cover the remaining gym leaders, but if you're wanting some crazy in-depth look at these battles, uh, hey my friend, welcome to cross-gen runs where the Pokemon we take a look at are elite, and I feel like I'd be wasting both my time and your time if I kind of faked excitement and I made things more drawn 
thrown out than they need to be because the simple reality is that Haxorus, he's ready to eat. First up is Sabrina, and we do outspeed most things here. Just out of respect for Kadabra's high special, I take it out immediately, and then on the Mr. Mime, I need one setup to ensure the range is here. With Venomoth, I go for the more accurate Earthquake since Rock Slide isn't needed after the boost, and Alakazam is the only thing that's going to outspeed me for pretty much the rest of the game. It does get one crack at me, and it actually misses the incredibly pathetic Psy Wave, and then I just break its legs, and I think we can just strut out of the gym to the next one. As for Koga, Earthquake with no setup can one-shot everything outside of the Weezing, so I do set up once just so the total number of turns are the same overall, and this one it's barely enough to be even considered a speed bump. The speed badge boost is really good, but since we've already stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with multiple Alakazams, Haxorus doesn't really need it that much. And now we're whipping around at breakneck speed, and a brisk swim down to Cinnabar is on the table. Like the rest of the game, we aren't doing anything extra, and I would like to call out Pokemon Mansion today. This place is so unfair to slow leveling group Pokemon because you'll see at level 39, I'm still getting encounters here. And if you are uninitiated, you can still get wild encounters through the repel if they are equal to or above your level. This is even more harsh in Pokemon Yellow since there are level 45 and 46 Pokemon down here. But this is overall, this is really annoying and I'm going to call out Pokemon Mansion to its face today. What's it going to do about it? Outside of that, it's time to just really sit down and ponder if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother! or not, and I've answered a ton of questions about TM28, and guys, let me just say that the joke is Tombstoner is Dig. They're one and the same. Now, if you want to see me go full meme and use it in a video, there are older ones you can check out. I'm not changing TM28. I'm not going to add it to a video ever again. Don't make me slap you. As for Blaine, this one is identical to Koga. Earthquake can one-shot everything, but we do need one sword stance to guarantee the Arcanine range, and I would like to call out one Space World Sprite in particular, and it's Rapidash. Guys, let me remind you that these Space World Sprites are all official Game Freak sprites they use for the beta of Gold and Silver games. And looking at this one, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, but you know, it is what it is. As for Arcanine, this one's pretty nice. It's actually one of my favorite Space World sprites, but let's end this one because the sprites, you know, when the sprites are more interesting than the battle, you gotta move on. Giovanni is up last, and if I didn't have to make this video in like three days, I would edit in maybe like a who wants to be a millionaire theme, and I'd ask you guys if you'd guess the strategy, but I'm pressed for time. I'm a little bit lazy. But if you thought that most of these things would be in a one-shot range, and maybe one swords dance would put everything into a guaranteed one hit, you'd be correct. Now, things to note here is the final new move of the run. It's Dragon Pulse we get it at level 42. It's been a real treat to use Outrage, but the only time special damage is going to be useful is going to be in the middle of one specific fight. And Outrage at this point and its self-inducing confusion along with Swords Dance, it just doesn't mix very well, but that's Red and Blue Giovanni. What else do you want me to say? We're done here, and I think we can jump straight into rival number six. And finally, Sand Attack is off the table. We don't have to have PTSD about missing four earthquakes in a row like last time. I still need the same strat here. Rock Slide on its own is not enough, so I have to set up one time and we take out the bird because I'll level up and notice how this puts me at 132 speed exactly. This is going to be I think the only time in the entire run that I actually need a speed badge boost and I'm going to set up for some extra damage for the eggs and then I'm going to get some extra speed and at that point I can just mow down Rhyhorn, Growlithe and execute in the middle of the street like the degenerates that they are and when it comes to Alakazam notice that it has 133 speed and that's why we needed the boost. With no sand attack to stop us this time and a plus four on my attack. This one's a done deal. We blast everything down and at the end we level up to a perfect little level 44. We put a little bow on this part of the game. After the battle, I use all of the remaining nine rare candies that I have, and this is so that I don't get annoying encounters through the repel inside of Victory Road. Now, I went over this with Pokemon Mansion, and it's more rare there, but going into Victory Road underleveled, you're just begging to have multiple minutes added to your time, so this is the safest way to go about it. And since we are at a nice level 53 for damage rounding threshold, and we have established that we have enough speed to not need to manipulate our experience, I think I can skip the rare candy inside of Victory Road, and there's a little elephant in the room with us here. Here and, and it's ice damage. In a Gen 1 setting, it's literally our only weakness, and we got Lorelai fast approaching, but that's enough talk, guys. I think it's time we get down to it. We take a look at the Elite Four, and let's see how it goes. <laughs> Dude. 
Dugong is first and I need some help here so I'm gonna dance with some swords but this does open me up for an attack and you can see just how much damage we take here from an Aurora Beam and you might think that things are not looking great but fellas sit back and let me show you the extreme power of Haxorus. With just a single setup I'm already ready to go and not only that I don't even need Rock Slide for most of things outside of Oyster and Lapras. Slowbro is tanky but it doesn't have an ice move but I do crit and I lose that one shot range on the Cloister but it doesn't matter. Either way it's a quick battle and I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm not going to cut and I'm going to show you guys my path through the Elite Four for the most part. At least the first few battles. I don't heal. I don't use an Elixir and as for Bruno I do set up once. This one was actually for the special badge boost because it actually lets us use Dragon Pulse to one shot everything outside of the Machamp and at the end I use a boosted Earthquake to put that down and this is just like a textbook Bruno fight. Now let me know down below if I should put Hiker Anthony back in his place for next week. Now we are in for one of my favorite things that happens in Gen 1 solo runs. Now notice there's no healing, there's no elixirs. Once again we go straight to Agatha and today Agatha is one of the easiest battles in the entire game. I don't need any setup, I don't need any extra speed and the one thing that's kind of a variable in this run and not guaranteed is that Golbat is essentially going to be a coin flip with the Rock Slide. Now here I actually get the range so it doesn't even matter and this one's just clean and I just absolutely love to see it since Agatha is often a hassle with weaker Pokemon. Now the no item streak comes to an end. I have to use an elixir. I have to use a full restore here but let's take a look at Lance. Here I do need a Swords Dance for multiple Pokemon ranges but there's no real threat from Gary today. Good AI means that it's only going to use Dragon Range and while 40 HP flat damage does sting a little bit we've already established how this move pretty much fell off a cliff around the time we fought Misty so it's really not that bad. I set up, I rock slotted out of the air and we can move on and outside of Bruno this is one of the only uses for Dragon Pulse in the game. Dragon is only super effective against other dragons and we can save a little bit of PP here with it on the first two Dragonairs since they aren't as bulky and when we level up after those two we have exactly 172 speed and I don't know if I've ever explicitly stated this in a video but 170 speed on Lance's Aerodactyl it's the fastest mandatory Pokemon in the entirety of Pokemon Red and Blue and while it's not really necessary to outspeed it most of the time it could crit on a Hyper Beam and I think this just makes it a little bit more consistent it was kind of like an accident I didn't really plan for this the damage boost from Swords Dance also puts it into a guaranteed one shot and it does the same for Dragonite at the end and this one had a little bit more girth and explanation to it compared to the other Elite Four members but I do love analysis it's what I like to do. After the battle, you guys can see once again, I'm not healing. I don't have to use an elixir. And I'm showing this because I think it's just kind of cool how dominant the late game of this Pokemon was. But we do have one more battle left, and I think it's time we hop in. Pidgeot is first and things are looking kind of familiar here. Rock Slide alone is it can't get the job done so I need one Swords Dance and it puts the Pidgeot into a guaranteed one shot range. So I set up. There's no threat of a Sand Attack just like rival number 6. I get out of here with no hassle and we've already talked about speed. So Alakazam, it's already cooked. But I really, I really do. I love to watch this Pokemon's health bar go all the way down really fast. And when we get to the Rhydon, I actually do fully set up to the maximum plus 6 attack boost for one specific reason. And I want to call this part out so pay attention if you're not. I get hit with the Leer after I've set up and it triggers the badge boost. And for a very small brief moment in history, Haxorus ascends to God status with 999 attack. And this is the hard coded limit for a maximum on a stat, so it's the highest attack anything could ever be at. And I do level up immediately after, so it's kind of a short lived moment, but we didn't set up all the way for Arcanine. It might have a really cool Space World Sprite, I like it a lot, but let's get it out of here. We can talk about some eggs real quick. Executor to me is one of the most annoying and hard to deal with Pokemon in the game. It's up there with like Gyarados and Alakazam to me. And you really don't want to get hit with Hypnosis, so that's why I opted to fully set up here. And I hope you guys love this Pokemon because soon, I don't think it's going to be next week. I don't know when the Parasect race is going to be because the communication for that run has been god awful, if I'm being honest with you. But sometime soon, if not next week, the week after that, a Lolan Executor and an Execute stream. So if you love eggs, it's a good time for the channel. But I think it's about time we wrap this one up. Blastoise, it's tanky in its own right, but you guys, you know how it's going to go down. I slap it around, and just like that, the run is over.
And that's it, Axorus has done it. Now, like I mentioned in the Rauchy video last week, I did get past this text to work, and I do talk about the, that in the rules video that's uh, unlisted in the description, but the final time here is two hours, three minutes, and 13 seconds, and it's a pretty good time, but Axorus is still pretty far out from being at the top level of these kind of runs, and I'm not gonna have a tier list today because like I said earlier, I've been pre-recording videos in preparation for a long hiatus and trip, but I did make this video and I did insert it like really late. Like I just recorded this a couple of days ago. I had already pretty much made like five more cross-gen runs after this, so Haxorus, it's going to take a little bit to be featured on the tier list, but it will be there eventually. And just for you guys, I'm going to preview a new formula and a tier card that I've been working on. Now, don't think too hard about this. It's not finalized yet, but the number at the top is a letter grade out of 100, and the bottom is going to be the resets and the time. This isn't final. It could change, but I am going to convert all of my runs into these types of cards. We've been using the first draft on other cards, and it's going to be a little bit awkward. I think maybe next week, maybe the week after, Parasect maybe might come out because it's been delayed uh, probably about 400 times now. But in that video, I recorded that like at the 1st of May and I was just talking about the original tier cards that we've already been using. So it's going to be a little bit awkward. I'm tired of talking about that video. Honestly, it's been delayed so many times. I just, I'm over it. I want it to come out so I can get that burden off my shoulders so I can stop worrying about it. But that's neither here nor there. Maybe it'll be out soon. I don't want to babble on too long. Uh, and like I said early, I'm working on getting members and Patreons access to these ROM patches. It might take me a little bit to iron out all the details. It's a work in progress, but it's just kind of a way for me to show thanks since most of you signed up without the promise of reward. And since the other content is already recorded, I'm not really going to mention that in those videos, but I think that's about all I have for you guys. I'm pretty much done here now. Go get your shiny Axus tomorrow, June 10th in Pokemon Go. And if you're watching this after the community days already happened, then that kind of sucks for you. Bye.